guess we just haven't had enough stress yet, so here's a couple more of the most suspenseful stories I've ever heard. Let's dive right into the troubled, scary waters as we talk part three of the top 10 terrifying things people did to survive. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ann Rogers. This story of 72 year old Ann from Tucson, Arizona starts out on March 31st of 2016. After taking some wrong turns on a remote dirt road, Ann found herself a little lost, out of fuel, and out of range of cell phones. This led to her family, of course, reporting her missing. On the first night, Ann made a good decision by staying with her car. She had some extra clothes with her, which helped keep her warm. She had some extra water and some snacks for sustenance. The next day, however, Anne was feeling restless and like she needed to do something, so she left her car. Survival experts usually warn against that, and for a fair reason. If Anne had stayed with her car, she would have been found on April 3rd, which is when police found the abandoned car, but as we know, that didn't happen. Thankfully, however, Anne was still out there, and she was actually doing quite a good job at keeping herself alive. She built fires every night, she drank, quote, pond water to keep her hydrated, and she even found edible plants to consume, and at one point, a turtle, which she roasted and ate one night. Apparently, Anne had taken a class on survival, and she continued to research after the class, as she was particularly interested in desert survival. Talk about a coincidence, right? Apparently, at some point in her journey, Anne became frustrated that authorities hadn't found her yet. She has since said, quote, I was frustrated, but I knew there were people who cared enough to make sure somebody found me. That is definitely true, Anne, but the authorities were also putting in a lot of effort. There were man trackers, scent dogs, and aircrafts all searching for her, and Anne was sure to use her skills to help them out. She made a large sign that read help from sticks and rocks, and this is what was spotted on the ninth day of her having been missing. The pilot who spotted her called for help and has said, quote, I was completely shocked. Up to that point, I thought we were looking for a body. I didn't expect to find her alive. The helicopter was able to swoop in and pick her up, and Anne was treated at a local hospital and released a short while later. Anne was impressively prepared. She stayed calm, and she did a lot of things that helped herself stay alive and be found, which is truly commendable. I think I might suddenly sign up for a survival course, you know, just in case. In our number nine spot today, we have the Donner Reed Party. If you are unfamiliar, the Donner Reed Party was a group of American pioneers who set out to head to California in 1846 in a wagon train. Apparently, there was something that caused some delays for this trip, and instead of waiting for a better time, they set out, which only doomed them in the end. The group ended up becoming stuck for the winter of 1846 to 1847, and they were snowbound in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Some of the group couldn't withstand these harsh temperatures and unforgiving environment, and they ended up succumbing to either starvation or sickness or perhaps a combination of the two. Those who were still alive had to resort to consuming those who had already passed away in order to stay alive. The group was snowed in high in the mountains, and the first of their help didn't arrive until February of 1847, almost four full months after they had become trapped in the first place. Two other rescue parties later came to them to bring them food and try to get at least some of the party out of the mountains. In the end, only 48 of the original 87 members ended up living to reach California. This sadly all could have been avoided in a multitude of ways, mostly by waiting until a more appropriate time to take this journey, but it is possible that they didn't know, and it's likely that no one expected this kind of tragedy to occur. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Gremlin Special. Okay, there are tribes of people that exist on this earth that we refer to as quote, uncontacted. Basically, there are communities or groups of indigenous people who live without sustained contact with other communities. Many of them want to be left alone to live their lives the way they choose, which is definitely something that should be respected. Some of these communities are hostile to visitors from the outside, which is pretty understandable, and some have ways of life that are extremely different from ours, which also makes a lot of sense. This is exactly why you can imagine everyone's surprise when a plane crashes right into the middle of an island that has a group of people who have a tradition where they consume the flesh of their enemies. On May 13, 1945, a US Air Force C-47 that had been nicknamed the Gremlin Special ended up crashing in New Guinea. Out of 24 people that it carried, only three of them survived the crash. Lieutenant John McCollum, who surprisingly was relatively unharmed, Women's Army Corps Corporal Margaret Hastings, and Sergeant Kenneth Decker, both of which were quite badly hurt. Well, as it turns out, sometimes rumors and rumblings are not at all what they turn out to be. While these three survivors were undoubtedly terrified to learn that they had crashed on an island full of cannibals, they soon realized that the stories they had heard were far from the actual truth. Oh. What a surprise! In the end, luckily for these three survivors, the group of people they came into contact with were exceptionally kind to them and helped nurse them back to health. In the end, they spent 42 days in the jungle, some of which were certainly more difficult than others, but in the end, they as well as their rescue crew were saved from the island and taken back home where they could continue to recover. In our number 7 spot today, we have the fishermen. This story starts off when five men left a fishing village in Mexico on October 28, 2005 in the hopes to head out on a several day long fishing expedition. The first 
of many bumps in the road to occur was when they lost their heavy shark fishing tackle. Then, as they were trying to recover this lost tackle, their boat ran out of fuel. So far, not good. The shore winds pushed them further out to sea, and before they knew it, they were caught up in the current and being taken 5,000 miles deeper into the open ocean. While this was happening, the boat's owner, known as Juan David, as well as one of the fishermen on board, called El Farcero, passed away from starvation, and the other members buried them at sea. On August 9th, 2006, a Taiwanese fishing trawler spotted the boat and ended up rescuing the rest of the men. If you notice the date I started with and what date we're now at on their rescue, you'll realize that, yep, they last nine months and nine days lost at sea. This is one of the longest on record in terms of sea survival, and the three survivors apparently did this by turning towards what they knew best. Fishing. This kept them fed on their journey along with the catching and eating of raw seabirds, which one of the members was apparently so good at catching, it earned him the nickname The Cat. They still had some knives and other small equipment with them and they used what they had to make hooks from engine parts and lines from cables. They learned to live off of this raw diet, they drank fish blood when there wasn't enough rainwater, and they passed the time by singing, dancing, pretending to play guitar, and praying. The worst of the times were in December and January when they were faced with harsh storms. They were unable to fish and there was a serious and very real threat that their boat might sink. The longest the men went without food was 13 days when the three of them only had one seabird to share the entire time. In the end, as we know, they were rescued and taken back to their home where they were hailed as heroes. In our number 6 spot today we have the Lykov family. In 1936, a Russian family of four was fleeing religious persecution and to do so they fled into the Siberian wilderness. They took with them a few possessions and some seeds and retreated into the forest. Here they would build a series of primitive huts as they traveled through until they finally reached a spot they found habitable, which was near the Mongolian border. They had no contact with the outside world and managed to become completely self-sufficient. When they originally fled into the wilderness, the family consisted of a husband and wife and their two children, and while out here in their new home, the couple had two more children, making them a family of six. They spent their days hunting, trapping, and farming, and each year they saved their seeds in order to replant when the next season came around. One of the possessions they brought with them was a crude spinning wheel, which allowed them to turn hemp into fiber for their clothing. They ate a lot of potato pads that were mixed with hemp seeds and ground rye, and they lived like this for almost 50 years. They grew as much food as the land would allow, and they rationed carefully, but each year they grew closer and closer to starvation. As they grew closer to starving, they held a council meeting where they discussed whether or not they should save their seeds to replant or eat them all. Each year they ultimately decided to save their seeds, and one winter this cost the mother her life, which she sacrificed for her children. Until a geology team in 1978 found their home, the two youngest children had never even met a person outside of their family. While most of the family has since passed away, one member, the youngest daughter, as of 2019 still lives in this isolated location where she has built herself quite a decent hut and has a herd of goats and a coop of chickens. I'm not sure if this story is about devotion or if it shows how teamwork is essential or how people's faith can really keep them going or how survival instincts are the ultimate tool. Maybe it's just all of that wrapped up into one. In our number 5 spot today we have Madeline Connolly. Madeline was a Chicago woman who was out in Montana visiting an uncle of hers. While on this little trip, she set out with her dog for a nice little hike during the daytime, and while she wasn't familiar with the trail, it was marked so she felt like all should be well. Since it was a nice day when she left and she planned to be back before dark, she didn't bring a jacket with her or any food. By the time nightfall came and she wasn't home, she realized that she had gone far off the trail and wasn't even close to being home. Maddie said that she hiked quite late into the night, but ultimately decided to lay down, snuggle up with her dog so that they could both keep warm and get some rest before the next day. The following day, Maddie and her dog hiked the entire day, but still ended up having to spend the night sleeping outside as they were still lost and rescue didn't seem like it was coming. Maddie and her furry companion drank creek water and ate glacier lilies for seven days while they tried to stay alive and find a way out. After seven days of hiking, Maddie on many occasions felt like all hope was lost, but in an amazing and startling turn of events, Maddie and her pup ended up running into the party that was out searching for them. The pair were rescued and taken back home. They received the medical treatment they needed and in the end, they made it out alright. In our number 4 spot today we have Jan Balsrud. Jan was a young instrument maker during the era of World War II, and he was asked to help the anti-Nazi resistance in Norway during the war. This led to him being on a boat that was traveling through the icy Norwegian waters, which is where the beginning of this story really takes place. While on board the ship, German soldiers began to shower the boat with bullets, which took the lives of everyone on board except for Jan. He managed to dive into the freezing waters with only one boot and sock on, and minus one big toe that had just been shot off. While being pursued by at least 50 of these German soldiers, he swam to the Norwegian coast where two girls who were on the beach helped him. There were several other Norwegian citizens who then came to
to secretly help him reach safety in Sweden, but it wasn't an easy route. At one point, he was traveling through the mountains while also trying to protect himself from an ambush style attack, and while doing so, he found himself caught up in an avalanche that caused him to fall 300 feet and left him snow blind and severely concussed. He then aimlessly wandered in the snow for days, suffering from hallucinations. He was then found by some kind person who helped nurse him back to health. Once healthy again, he then made another push to try and get to Sweden, but again was held back by German soldiers. He had to hide out in ice holes where he then had to cut off the rest of his toes to save his feet, and at one point he even attempted to take his own life because things were just so bad. In the end, this thankfully didn't work and he was able to make it all the way safely to Sweden. This story definitely shows his bravery, his quick decision making and skills, but it also shows how everyone needs a little help along the way sometimes. In our number 3 spot today we have Vesna Volovic. On January 26th, 1972, Vesna was a 22 year old flight attendant and she was signed to JAT Yugoslav Airlines Flight 367 from Stockholm to Belgrade with a stopover in Copenhagen. Apparently, the company which she worked for had actually mistaken her for another employee who shared the same name, but since she had never been to Denmark before, she just saw it as an opportunity to travel and went on the flight anyway. Less than an hour on the journey from Copenhagen to Belgrade, the flight exploded midair. The plane fell from its height of 33,000 feet and landed in a village in what today is the Czech Republic. A member of the village, Bruno Honk, went to inspect the crash site, of course not expecting to find any survivors, but he found one. Vesna. He pulled her from the wreckage and used his knowledge that he had as a World War II medic to keep her alive until rescue came. Among the 28 people on board the plane that day, Vesna was the only survivor. She suffered three broken vertebrae, two broken legs, broken ribs, and a fractured skull, and once she arrived in the hospital, she was in a coma for several days. When she awoke, she had no memory of the accident at all. Doctors didn't think she would ever be able to walk again, but after just 10 months, she was able to. Apparently, she credits this to her quote, Serbian stubbornness. Vesna's story is still one of the most incredible survival stories and it landed her this strange Guinness World Record of Longest Fall Without a Parachute, which I don't think is a title she is too keen on holding. There are a number of reasons why people believe she escaped her certain death. Some believe her position in the rear of the airplane with the food cart prevented her from being sucked into the air when the plane broke apart. The plane's impact was also softened by the trees in the snow, but I think, hey, the woman survived a plane crash. Whatever the reasons or whatever led to that, it's all incredible and we should just focus on that. Vesna has been quoted as saying, Quote, Everyone thinks I am lucky, but they are mistaken. If I were lucky, I would never have had this accident. In our number two spot today, we have Tammy Ashcraft. If you've seen the movie Adrift, which stars Shailene Woodley, then you might be familiar with this story. In September of 1983, Tammy and her fiance Richard Sharp set out on a 4,000 mile journey across the Pacific Ocean in order to help a friend deliver a 44 foot yacht from Tahiti to San Diego. This was much longer than the pair had ever sailed before, but they felt due to their experience and having each other, they would be able to do it. So I mentioned they set sail in September, and by October, a Category 4 hurricane blew them way, way, way off course. The pair tried to ride out the storm that was kicking up 40 foot waves and 140 mile per hour winds, you know, hurricane stuff. And when Richard told Tammy to head below deck, right after, she heard him scream, and before she could help, she was thrown against a cabin wall and knocked unconscious. When she awoke the next day, she found the yacht mostly destroyed, and Richard was nowhere to be found. She found his safety harness dangling over the end of the boat, which caused her to realize that he had been thrown overboard. The cabin was filling with water, the masts were broken, the sails were dragging in the sea, and both the navigational system and engine were in not very good condition. Despite her injuries and her loss, Tammy kicked into survival mode. She used a broken pole and a storm jib to create a makeshift sail, and she began pumping water out of the cabin. She found a sextant and a watch which helped her navigate towards the closest landmass, which was the 1,500 mile away island of Hilo, Hawaii. In total, she spent 41 days adrift at sea and survived by eating canned fruit salads and sardines. In the end, she was saved by a Japanese research ship that had noticed the drifting yacht near the coast of the island. For six years after the accident, because of her head injury, she was unable to read, but when she was more recovered, she penned a book about the whole ordeal. Since she has spoken about the entire thing, saying, quote, definitely the hardest part was dealing with Richard being gone. There were times I didn't even want to live anymore because I didn't know how I was going to go on. I was never going to fall in love again. But she also added that, quote, but actually, while I was in the survival mode, the grief was fairly low. It wasn't as intense as when I got to shore and the survival was over, and I could see people together and everything kept reminding me of him. I just really had a hard time, but the survival instinct while at sea just kicked in. It helped me to focus, to keep myself on track. Tammy's story is definitely a reminder of just how strong our instincts can be. In our number one spot today, we have Beck Weathers. In the spring of 1996, American pathologist Beck Weathers headed out on an expedition to summit Mount Everest as a part of an eight-member 
undercover crew that was led by veteran mountaineer Rob Hall. As the group got further and further up the mountain, Beck began to realize that due to an eye surgery he had previously had, he wasn't able to see very well in the harsh climate, and once it got dark out, his visibility was frighteningly low. Because of these vision troubles, when the group got near to the summit, Rob, the leader, told Beck to stay on the side of the trail while he took the rest of the group to the top, and he assured them that they would come back to get him on their way back down. Beck didn't really want to do this, but he agreed. He waited and waited and saw other groups pass him on their way down, and some others even offered to take him, but he stayed and waited for Rob. Unfortunately, Rob would never come back. Once the group had reached the summit, one of the climbers was too weak to continue on, and Rob refused to leave his side. One of the group members who did descend ended up passing Beck, which is how he got this information, and Beck decided to wait for another member of the team who was on their way down, Mike Groom, because he was Rob's fellow team leader. Once Beck was with Mike and the other climbers, they began making their way down, but of course, there was a blizzard brewing. The storm left Beck and the other climbers quite disoriented, and they couldn't find Camp 4, which was the camp that was closest to the summit. When the storm broke, Beck and four other climbers were so weak that they were left alone so that those who were stronger could go off in search of help. Another guide from another group came to rescue several of the climbers, but at this point, Beck wasn't there anymore. This is because he had previously lost one of his gloves, and he began to really feel the effects of the high altitudes and absolutely freezing temperatures, which led to a sort of delirium. He apparently jumped to his feet, yelled out, I've got this all figured out, and then was subsequently thrown from his feet, toppling over the other climbers by gale force winds. The other climbers were sure he had died, but he didn't. Instead, he was spending the night in a bivouac in a blizzard with his hands and face exposed to the elements. When he woke up, he figured that he had been left for dead, and he started to think, if I don't get up right now, then this is all going to be over very quickly. His sheer willpower managed to get him up, and he hiked all the way back down to Camp 4 on his own. His fellow climbers were shocked to see him, and they still didn't believe he was going to live, so they thought they might as well just make him comfortable. In a tent alone, Beck made it through another freezing night in utter agony, thanks to his frozen hands and face, and the next day the other climbers were again shocked to see him still alive and coherent. Finally, they helped him walk on his frozen feet down to a camp lower down, where one of the highest altitude medical evacuations performed by a helicopter was done. In the end, four of the people on Beck's original group passed away, but Beck escaped with his life. Following the rescue, he had his right arm amputated halfway between the elbow and wrist, all four fingers and his thumb on his left hand were amputated, as well as parts of both of his feet. His nose was amputated and reconstructed with tissue from his ear and forehead. Following the entire ordeal, Beck has said that the experience was worth it because he gave him a renewed sense of purpose. He said, quote, I gave up some body parts, but I got back my marriage. I got back my relationship with my kids. I've got a new grandbaby. All in all, if I had to do it again, every pain, every misery, every bit of suffering that comes from it, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. All right, guys, that has been our list for today. Thank you so much for checking it out. I've been your host today, Olivia Kozlowski, and I'll see you next time. Bye.